It is my enormous pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Christine Ritchie. She's the Kenneth Meinerker Endowed Chair in Geriatrics and Director of Research for the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine at Mass General. She's a board certified geriatrician, palliative care physician and health services researcher. And she conducts research focused on optimizing quality of life for those with chronic serious illness. Dr. Ritchie co-leads the Dementia Palliative Care Clinical Trials Training Program and the National Home-Based Primary Care Learning Network, which seeks to improve our understanding and care of our homebound population. Dr. Ritchie directs the Center for Aging and Serious Illness Research in the Mass General Mangan Institute and the Mass General Hospital Dementia Care Collaborative. So it is a pleasure and an honor uh, beyond description uh, to welcome Dr. Ritchie. And I just wanna say a very few things. Um, typically um, when she speaks, when many of our uh, great speakers uh, give a presentation, we all wanna take notes. Um, Dr. Ritchie has told us that uh, she will be uh, able to send attendees her slides uh, in a few days. So don't worry about taking notes. She will be happy. You'll get everything uh, online. The other thing, as Chris said, uh, if you have any comments, thoughts, questions that just come to your mind throughout the program, write them in chat. And once Dr. Christie, Dr. Ritchie uh, ends her talk, I'll be reading your comments, asking questions, and we'll begin our process then. So again, Dr. Ritchie, welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Chris. Good to see everybody this evening. I'm looking forward to talking with you about a topic that is uh, one that actually I don't talk about as often as other items, but I uh, feel like is important uh, for us to discuss. And let's see if I can get back to where I was. There we are. Uh, and that is about strategies for our memory now. Uh, so regardless of where we are in our own journey, uh, we can benefit from thinking about how we can uh, do well by our brain. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, strategies today. So Here's what we'll do. We'll first talk about uh, dementia versus memory impairment, because I think uh, we find a lot of people say, well, what if I'm having trouble with um, finding a word or I lost my keys this morning or things like that? Am I developing dementia? So we'll talk about that. And many of you probably already have a good sense of that yourself. And then, uh, then we're going to talk about actually some strategies that have been put forward by the Lancet Commission and the World Health Organization around what we can do to reduce our risk for developing dementia, slow our uh, cognitive decline journey, if that is a journey that we're on, uh, and actually, in general, improve our overall well-being. So looking forward to talking about this with you. I uh, know that our way of conversing with each other will be through the chat, so I hope you will use the chat to converse because I'm hoping that we can make this at least as, as interactive as possible. So let's proceed. What I'm also asking you to do tonight is to think of one thing that we talk about today, one thing that you might like to initiate as a change in your life based on our reflections on the different things that we can do to uh, reduce our risk for developing dementia or reduce our um, rate of cognitive decline. And I hope that as you go through this, many of these things you'll probably go, I've done, I do that, I'm good. And that's awesome. And we will celebrate that with you. And if there's one thing that you feel like you could possibly do to make a change, I'm hoping that at the end, we can have a waterfall chat and give everybody an opportunity to talk about that one thing that they'd like to potentially make a, a change on after reflecting on the various things that we can do to improve our well-being and to uh, reduce service for cognitive decline. 
So we'll start with dementia and memory impairment, because I think it is important just as a level setting thing to talk about the difference. And I'm guessing with this crowd that you may be relatively more expert about this difference than many. But still, what I'd like you to do is tell us in the chat, what are things that we commonly see that are age-related changes that relate to our cognition that are not um, dementia? So just put in the chat some things that you know happen as a result of age uh, that are age-related changes. And um, uh, we'll talk about that first. Word finding, thank you. Slower to process, slower to retrieve names, great. A few others that come to mind. Losing keys, yes. Misplacing items, indeed. Excellent. So yes, those are all things that commonly we do see that are age-related changes. And the things that um, are, are common are this slightly decreased rapidity in thinking. So just um, capturing a, a concept may, our processing speed may be slower as we get older, um, and that is not an indication of dementia. We may find that we have to work just a touch harder at sustaining attention, and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit later, but difficulty sustaining attention. We may find that we have more trouble with multitasking. Now, I think um, multitasking is highly overrated. Um, what we know from now the literature is that nobody actually does any particular task as well when they're multitasking, but it is true that it often becomes more difficult to multitask as we get older. And uh, also holding information in mind that's new uh, without some strategies for holding it. Word finding, you all brought that up. But here's the good news. There are some things actually that we're better at as we get older. As a general matter, our vocabulary is better than younger people. Um, our reading and verbal uh, reasoning also remain unchanged and for many even improve during the aging process. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's some good things that also happen as we get older with respect to our cognition. Now, what are those things that actually could be suggestive of dementia as opposed to um, uh, age-related memory changes. Again, if you all could just put some things in the chat that are more worrisome for dementia. So childhood memories become stronger and maybe another way of saying that is it's easier for us to retain memories from the distant past than it is for us to retain memories from the recent past. Uh, forgetting what the keys are for, absolutely. So not just forgetting the keys, but forgetting what the keys are for. Other things? Finding your way home, excellent. So these are all really important examples of some of the different changes that we see that are not just suggestive of age-related memory changes, but are suggestive of dementia. And what are those things? Well, first, problems with complex mental tasks. So not things that are straightforward, but uh, let's say uh, we were really good at a particular um, word processing uh, tool or uh, perhaps with a complex activity that we've done in the past, we may have more trouble with that um, if we're developing dementia. Um, not only um, losing things intermittently and being able to, uh, but not being able to retrace our steps and misplacing them over and over again um, and not recognizing even that we've misplaced them. Sometimes people who are living with dementia feel pretty certain that somebody else has taken their things because they don't remember that they've actually lost them and are unable to retrace their steps. Changes in mood or behavior, changes in personality and loss of initiative, becoming more passive. Now, for some of you um, who are uh, um, 
caring for somebody living with dementia, you may have observed this, which is this sort of concept called apathy, where maybe somebody even who is very hard driving in the past seems to be sort of, frankly, just less interested in things and have be- and becomes more passive. And that is not an uncommon feature of dementia, um, as is uh, sometimes increased uh, uh, features of anxiety. We see that people who um, have age-related, uh, excuse me, who have dementia also are um, forgetful in that they really have trouble encoding new information, especially learned information, which is why uh, we often will hear repeated questions from people who are have, who um, are developing dementia because they don't remember that they've asked us the question. They may have difficulty performing tasks that in the past were completely familiar, things like tying shoes, things like using the microwave, using the um, um, the TV, all of those uh, generally familiar tasks become more difficult. Problems with language, not just um, 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 occasional word finding problems, but actually with coming up with words or uh, as was noted in the chat, they might even have difficulty knowing what a word means and um, use a different word when they're trying to find that word. Disorientation to time and place, which can lead lead to um, folks getting lost um, and poor decreased judgment. The big thing is that a particular um, cognitive change is called dementia when it actually affects function. So we all may lose our keys every now and then. We may have trouble with our words. We may even remember um, forget how to do something that we've done in the past or that it's harder for us to do, but we're able to do it. It doesn't affect our function. But when we have dementia, that changes. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is because regardless of where we are, whether or not we're living with dementia or we are in in that place where we're having age-related changes related to our cognition, there are things that we can do to either slow decline or to potentially prevent dementia altogether. And here's the thing that I think many people don't realize, and that is that risk factors Uh, account for up to 40% of our reasons for dementia, and they are modifiable risk factors, not things like our genes that are immutable, our family history, but there are many, many things that we can do that can either prevent or delay um, our development of dementia or um, slow our cognitive decline. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to really be ambitious about prevention and thinking about ways in your life you can make changes that decrease your risk for either developing dementia or or slow decline. So what are those things? Well, we're gonna first talk about diet and exercise and I'm gonna get really specific because I think specificity is what enables us to actually figure out how we're going to do this in our own lives. Then we're gonna, uh, excuse me, then we're gonna talk about uh, health and habits and then we'll talk about memory strategies. So diet first. why don't you put in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, some fe- features of diet that you, that you know actually could potentially reduce your risk for kind of decline. Some of these we hear all over the place, so I'm guessing a few may come to mind. What are some dietary changes that we can make that actually are important for reducing our rate of cognitive decline. Good, thank you. Uh, Eat more berries, lentils, Mediterranean diet, eat more vegetables, exactly, low fat, less sugar, increased fish and vegetables. Okay, so this, this group has a very good sense of this already, and I just wanna show you some scientific data that shows how important this is. So, Uh, There have been a number of studies that have sought to identify the kinds of diet that seem to be most productive and uh, promoting of uh, of health, reduce our risk for general systemic inflammation, and reduce our risk for both cardiovascular disease um, uh, and uh, dementia. And the one that has um, gotten the most play is called the MIND diet. And many of you may have heard of this, the MIND diet stands for the Mediterranean DASH diet intervention for neurodegenerative delay. It's a mouthful. Um, The DASH diet is a diet that was actually developed to reduce blood pressure and was shown that um, adherence to the DASH diet, which is a very um, um, large pivot towards um, fairly robust uh, 
consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables and specific kinds of fruits and vegetables showed um, in a very large study to reduce um, uh, uh, high, uh, risk for hypertension and reduce um, people's blood pressure by um, a meaningful number of millimeters of mercury um, with adherence to that diet. The MIND diet basically took the DASH diet along with the Mediterranean diet to combine to sort of create um, the key features of um, sort of healthful uh, brain promoting uh, diets. And here are the key features. So the key features here are um, fairly robust consumption of green leafy vegetables, uh, berries, nuts, uh, the use of olive oil as a primary, primary oil as opposed to others, a reduction in the consumption of dairy products like butter and cheese, um, um, an increase in the consumption of fish and a decrease in the consumption of red meat, decrease in the consumption of fruits, uh, uh, fast foods, pastries, sweets, um, and an increased consumption in beans. Probably nothing terribly surprising for you there, but I would like you to just pay attention to these three different um, categories because essentially what they will show us in the next um, slide is the value of um, making these changes. So in this study, which was a very large um, study um, that followed people over a very um, long period of time, what we saw is that um, the rate of cognitive decline, it, depending on your score, so you saw the low score, the mid score and the high score, was pretty substantial over a 10 year period, where on the global cognitive um, score, there was a fairly steep trajectory of decline in those who had a low or a, you know, what we consider a poor mind diet compared to um, those who had a high score on the mind diet, a much slower rate of cognitive decline. So what I like about the study is that it shows not only scientifically the meaningful difference this makes, it also shows that this is not sort of a fad type thing. It's not like eating berries, you know, once and then sort of saying, forget about it. It's really making changes in your life over the long haul. And um, it uh, also shows in the slide I showed you just a, a minute ago, some of the sort of very concrete changes that you can make um, that will improve your likelihood for um, uh, brain health. This is another study that just um, recently uh, uh, came out last year. It's also interesting because it particularly looked at um, the use of uh, ultra processed foods, which, you know, as you know, is becoming um, a very common occurrence. There's just uh, so many foods on the market that are ultra processed. And just to show you sort of what you're looking at here, um, this was a study actually that was done in China. Um, and that included about 78,000 people um, who were followed um, over a number of years. And the uh, y-axis um, is the risk, that's actually the, what's called the hazards ratio for the development of different kinds of dementia. And the um, x-axis is the proportion of ultra-processed food in the diet, okay? So 0%, 10, 20, 30, and then up to 50%, okay? So the under A, what you can see is that the risk for the development of any kind of dementia is increased as you increase the proportion of someone's um, consumption of ultra-processed food. Um, that uh, risk is uh, uh, um, increased uh, for Alzheimer's disease, but particularly um, increased for um, the development of vascular dementia Probably no surprise here because, um, as we know, vascular dementia um, often uh, accompanies or has a parallel set of risk factors to cardiovascular disease. And we know that ultra processed food is also a high risk factor for cardiovascular disease. But I think it's still interesting that we see um, fairly meaningful relationships um, across the board, um, even for um, Alzheimer's disease in this, um, um, in this particular study. What about exercise? So exercise is another thing that um, you often probably have heard is important for uh, uh, reduction in um, risk for the development of dementia and cognitive decline. There are a whole host of reasons for that. Um, we believe that uh, it, it probably helps with um, removal of 
of some of the you know kind of waste protein, the tau and amyloid proteins in the brain. Um, it also decreases uh, cardiovascular risk. So it probably um, reduces um, overall systemic inflammation. So it probably has a number of different mechanisms by way by way um, by which way it works in in the brain. But here are the current guidelines based on a very um, um, robust number of of um, uh, epidemiologic um, studies and clinical trials. And what I'm always struck by when I look at this is how much actual work this takes to, um, to be adherent to this kind of recommendation. So the recommendation is at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. Um, and that actually has probably the strongest quality of evidence for, um, for it. Um, that's about 30 minutes of, of activity per um, day for five days or less if you're actually um, engaging in activity every every day, or you can engage in 75 minutes of vigorous um, activity per week. Now, one of the interesting studies that have come out recently suggests that you don't have to do this all in one fell swoop. Uh, you can do what they call aerobic bursts. Um, and so two aerobic bursts of 10 minutes a day um, is also um, seems to be effective in um, reducing risk for cognitive decline. Now, what I get asked a lot when, when I tell people about this 150 minutes or of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity is like, well, what does that actually mean? And what's considered moderate intensity and what's considered uh, vigorous intensity? So here are what is considered moderate intensity activity um, activities, walking, hiking, gardening, uh, dancing, uh, you know, ha um, doing household chores like sweeping, that sort of thing, um, moving things around. So not, you know, still something that makes you, your heart rate go up, right? Um, but not necessarily something that makes your um, heart rate get, go up so much that you, you can't, you're out of breath and you can't speak. Um, whereas vigorous activity generally um, is such, uh, is, is such um, a, a, um, amount of effort that you um, have uh, some trouble perhaps engaging in a conversation <laughs> because you're, you're, you know, you have, you're out of breath. So that can be fast cycling, um, fast swimming, jogging, running, uh, most competitive sports, that kind of thing. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, you know, if you're laying out your game plan for your week, um, what it would take um, in terms of identifying ways to get 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week or 150 minutes of moderate activity. And oftentimes the best way to do this is actually to plan uh, because otherwise life often gets in the way. In addition to those recommendations, um, the World Health Organization uh, and the Lancet Commission also recommend uh, look, doing engaging act activities that enhance balance or prevent falls three or more days a week and engaging in muscle strengthening activities um, uh, that involve your major muscle groups like your, your, um, your back, your glutes, your um, uh, large uh, leg muscles and arm muscles um, at least uh, two days per week. Now, here's one thing I have to say about balance. This is actually an area that I've been working on a lot lately, um, is uh, a, a recent rehabilitation um, opportunity afforded itself to me. And I would say is that a little bit every day can be a game changer. Uh, so just, you know, like this woman is doing, standing on one leg, you might start and it might be one second. And also, please be sure that you're um, holding on to something. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, just add time. Uh, it doesn't, these don't have to be complicated things. Uh, you know, doing leg uh, toe lifts can be really helpful in increasing the strength and balance of your ankles. But small things consistently is really what makes the difference here. All right, so now let's move on to habits and health. And again, some of these things will come as no surprise to you. Um, others may be um, more of an opportunity for you as you think about some habits or health that you might wanna change. So the first important habit to be aware of is 
um, to actually be very attentive to your blood pressure. So maintaining a systolic blood pressure of 130 or less in midlife and beyond um, is quite important. And uh, what we do know is antihypertensive treatment for hypertension is the only known effective medication preventive treatment for dementia is really important. And what we've come to appreciate is that actually um, um, robust treatment of blood pressure continues to be important as we age, um, regardless of our age. We may be less rigorous about um, being as low as 130 um, if, if we become quite frail and if we develop serious illnesses um, that are life-limiting in nature. But by and large, uh, being attentive to blood pressure can be very, very important as a preventive tool. So if you're starting to see your blood pressure start to creep up, really pay attention to that and think about what you can do to mitigate um, uh, hypertension. The second is around hearing. So there is some really interesting literature coming out these days about hearing loss. Hearing loss is ubiquitous. It's the third most common chronic condition in older adults. Um, and it's becoming increasingly linked to dementia um, incidents. And about 8% of dementia cases are estimated to be from hearing loss. And I would argue that actually that's probably an underestimate because there are many people who um, are developing hearing loss um, and start uh, checking out. Um, and when you start checking out, it's not only your hearing loss that becomes a problem, it affects your social connection, which is another risk factor for uh, dementia and can um, affect um, your ability to um, continue to engage with the world. So here is a study that is pretty much hot off the press. It came out um, this month uh, from uh, Lancet Public Health. And what's so remarkable about this study, first of all, it was done in over 430,000 people. So it was a very, very large study. Um, it was done out of the UK Biobank. And what is remarkable about the study is that they compared, so for people without hearing loss, that was the reference group. And then they looked at people without hearing aids and people with hearing aids. And what you can see is that the um, absolute risk increase for people without hearing aids, aids who do have hearing loss is about 35%. Um, um, and with hearing aids, there's no increased risk. So my plea to all of you who have hearing loss is go ahead and get hearing aids. Now, as somebody who has hearing aids, I can tell you they're a royal pain. They're hard to deal with. You have to, you know, depending on what kind you get, you either have to make sure you have batteries or you have to charge them. But it is um, increasingly important to recognize that hearing loss it seems to be very closely linked to the development of dementia. And this, liter this particular study, I think, really uh, brings it home uh, more of sort of um, prominently than most about the value of hearing aids in um, reducing our risk for the development of dementia. Sleep. So this is also one that um, many people don't uh, do regularly. Uh, and that is uh, something that we want to make sure that we pay attention to. Why is sleep so important? Sleep, in addition to exercise, seems to be a, a clearinghouse or a time when we do seem to remove um, uh, 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 toxic proteins from the brain. Uh, and so, um, and sleep is also associated with uh, sort of an anti-inflammatory process. But when people have insomnia or sleep disturbances or short sleep durations, then we tend to produce higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including C-reactive protein, which seems to serve as a, sort of a, a negative um, uh, or is a factory for the, the kinds of proteins in our brain that we don't want to keep. Um, and that continue to stay there. Um, one interesting factoid is that uh, it, it appears that we are more likely to um, have a removal of tau um, protein when we sleep on our side than on our stomach, excuse me, than on our back or our stomach. That was kind of sad for me to hear. I like sleeping on my, um, on my uh, back, but I think the more important thing to keep in, in mind is just the importance of sleep duration 
um, and engaging in efforts to make sure that you're not cutting corners uh, like I often do around sleep. This is another interesting study um, that uh, came out just a couple of years ago that looked at the importance of sleep duration. Now, there's some interesting things about the study which shows that actually too much sleep um, is uh, can be problematic in, a, in addition to too little sleep. But when we looked um, at the development of um, uh, dementia and also overall survival uh, with people who had too little sleep um, or too much sleep, uh, with the reference range being around six to seven, excuse me, six to eight hours of sleep per, um, per night. Um, people with less than five hours of sleep um, fared, the, fared the worse. That's the red line. And people with uh, greater than nine hours of sleep um, um, did uh, second worse. And so certainly having um, adequate duration of sleep is important. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this particular study, and it is true, is that as we develop cognitive decline and impairment, we often do see people develop higher levels, uh, higher um, durations of sleep, and um, also higher rates of sleep disruption. There are a number of other um, uh, habits I just want to uh, point to uh, briefly, um, and these are uh, habits that also have been associated with um, increased risk for dementia. So. Uh, smoking um, of any kind, uh, alcohol consumption, um, especially um, excessive alcohol consumption, which um, if any of you have been following the alcohol literature, uh, the, 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 um, the definition of excessive gets smaller and smaller. Uh, and so, you know, really being thoughtful about modest consumption of alcohol, um, minim minimizing your risk for obesity, or if you find that your weight is creeping up there, um, to look at ways to make sure that you are um, uh, staying in a place of healthy weight and then um, avoiding head injury. So wearing a helmet when you're cycling um, and really paying attention to ways uh, to, to actually keep your um, risk for development of head injury as low as possible. All right, now let's move to uh, reducing your risk with various uh, cognition strategies. And before we get started, um, I would love, um, with that, I would love to uh, hear from, actually, there's some questions. So we're gonna, we're gonna well, I'm gonna stop and ans answer some questions related to this topic, and then we'll go to cognition strategies, because otherwise I'm afraid I will lose the questions in the chat. Well, actually, Dr. Richie, I'm happy to read the questions, and then I've clustered some. Shall we do that? Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, we will carry on. Okay, so uh, do you uh, do you want to start now or do you want to wait till uh, the end? Well, let's wait till the end because I promise you, you won't okay. lose anything. Okay? Perfect. Sounds like a plan. So if that's the case, what I'd like for you all to do, I'm currently in the chat. Christine, you're muted. Uh, how about now? That's much better. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to, do, to hear from you in the chat is strategies either that you use or that you know of that um, can uh, help you with uh, your memory and reduce your um, challenges with cognitive changes or cognitive decline. So folks could just um, put in the chat, learning new things. Thank you. Indeed, that is actually a very important strategy. Other things? Getting out of my comfort zone. Indeed, walking in the woods. Yes. Reviewing high school yearbooks. Yes. Just looking and, um, and trying to keep track of um, old memories and renewing old memories so that they are imprinted as new memories. Scrabble, so games that affect your opportunity to um, address language and um, numbers doing word and number games, awesome. So these are all really great examples of things that you can do to reduce your risk for cognition um, um, and cognitive decline or to slow it. So there's a number that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna first talk about external strategies. Some of you all have brought these up and then we're gonna talk about internal strategies. So the first external strategy I really wanna highlight is the importance of social connection. 
Um, what we're learning about social connection is that um, social isolation and loneliness um, is uh, associated with increased mortality, increased cardiovascular disease risk, and increased risk for dementia. And uh, we now know that um, social isolation and loneliness, especially loneliness, um, from a mortality risk perspective is equivalent risk as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, for some of us, this may be good news. We like getting out. We like meeting new people. We, we're, um, we like being the life of the party. For others of us, this may feel hard. You know, it's hard sometimes to make uh, new friends, to make new social connections, to um, to get out of our comfort zones. And I think what's really an opportunity for us is to be thoughtful and intentional about making sure that we are getting into new places of social connection. So keeping your old friends, but making new ones and really working hard at engaging in um, uh, social activities and events that um, keep you socially engaged. From an intellectual perspective, when we are socially engaged, even like we are today in this Zoom room, it's a way to actually improve our um, well-being and also uh, reduce our risk for cognitive change. So what might be some tips for staying connected? Well, first is think about who already is in your social network. And if there's been somebody that's in that social network that you haven't been connecting with lately, reach out to them. This is actually kind of fun. I did this recently. I have a friend that I grew up with, haven't seen her forever. She lives in Seattle. And uh, I've I looked her up, found her, and reconnected with her. So identify those connections from your past, identify those connections that are from your present, that are vital, and think intentionally, plan intentionally for how you will connect with them in the same way that you plan to do your laundry or get your groceries or do other things in your life that are important. Make sure that you have people's contact information. Recently, I, uh, I got a new uh, cell phone and I lost all my old contact information. It was a real sadness. And it, but what it did give me the opportunity to do was to reach out and say, hey, you know what? I don't have your contact information anymore. Can you, can you please provide that to me? So getting people's contact information really reduces the load of reconnecting with them. Try new ways to connect with others. And I actually would love to hear in the chat some things that you can think of that you're not doing that might be new ways for connecting with people. It might be as one of my recent, um, a, a very dear friend of mine who recently lost her spouse did, is she found a Scrabble club at the public library and she started to go there to play Scrabble. She's never played Scrabble in her life. It was hilarious. They, you know, this, there were people there who were like very avid Scrabble players, and they had to give her all the two-letter words that she had never heard of, so that she could, you know, stay on the game. But the idea was: is do something that you haven't done before. Get creative and try new things. So I'd love to hear from you in the chat. What are things that you could do to socially connect that you're not doing that might put you slightly out of your comfort zone, but that would be a creative change? Maybe it's volunteering with an organization that you haven't volunteered with, but you thought about. Or um, maybe it's, uh, you know, um, creating a, a dinner, a dinner where either you're on Zoom or you're all together and you have topics that you talk about. I'm not seeing much in the chat. Oh, here we go. Exercise activity with a friend. Join a walking club. Good. What else? Be a pen pal. Yes. Love it. Get involved in a political campaign. Yes. These are great. Dogs are great connectors. Yes. Get a dog and meet up with people and go to the dog park. Um, a book club at a senior center. Take in home house guests. Excellent. Okay. Some good ideas are rolling in. So what I have personally found, both with my uh, friends and colleagues um, and, and with others, uh, is that this is actually hard work. 
So staying connected and connecting, especially with new people, it takes some creativity. It takes some work. It takes some intentionality and it takes some perseverance. You know, it's going to be like the first three times you try to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to get together. You know, they can't. So you're like, oh, well, so much for that. It really requires some perseverance. And yet it is critically important. And I think um, as we become um, more and more um, distant from family members, and um, as many of us are um, losing some of the friends that we've had in the past, this just becomes incredibly important to do as a proactive and intentional thing um, as a way to improve our well being. Start new hobbies interests and healthy habits and get help. All right. Some of you um, actually brought up this next one, which is the whole concept of awe. Um, and the idea here is that there is value um, um, and we don't even fully understand it. I have a colleague at UCSF who's doing research in this area, but there's value in getting out into nature um, and engaging in some appreciation of sort of transcendence, things that are bigger than we are um, on our brain health. And we don't completely understand why. Um, we don't know if it relates to some of the things that make mindfulness um, actually also uh, helpful for brain health. But anything that we can do to get out um, and engage in things that, that give us wonder, maybe it's just getting out and looking at the stars. Um, maybe it's getting out and enjoying um, the ocean. Um, those of us who live here in the Boston area, we're lucky. We're not that far from um, an, uh, a beach somewhere, but really uh, intentionally engaging in um, what, what I call awe uh, um, in, is, is, a, is now been shown to be important in um, reducing our risk for cognitive decline. Many of you may be familiar with the whole concept of mindfulness and presence, but mindfulness um, means being fully attentive to the here and now and also um, engaging in um, tools, cognitive tools that help us um, not let the past or the future rob us from the present. Uh, there are now a whole host of tools that are available to us, um, uh, both online and um, through apps, um, that can help us be more mindful and more uh, present to our, um, to our current uh, reality, our present moment. I put up one um, that's free an app that's free. The UCLA um, Mindfulness Awareness Research Center has a very nice app um, for mindfulness, especially if it's not something that you're used to and it seems a little sort of out there. Um, many of you probably engage in regular uh, mindfulness activities, but we do know that mindfulness is also important in um, improving our overall um, ability to take in new information and um, seems to be important in reducing cognitive decline. And when we talk about memory strategies, um, you'll get a sense of some of those um, reasons in a minute. Gratitude um, is sort of another form of what I would call mindfulness, which is sort of paying attention to those things that are going well in our life. Um, this is not about uh, what we would, what some people call toxic positivity. This is not about not giving voice to the things that are also hard in our life but being thoughtful and attentive to the things that we can be grateful for, um, whatever that might be in our own life. And that would look different um, depending on what it is. I think a corollary to this, um, maybe the yin yang of this is also being attentive and appreciative of our common humanity and the common challenges that we face. If we are a caregiver and we're caring for somebody living with dementia or we are somebody living with dementia, there's a difficulty in that. And so being aware that we're not alone and that we're part of a, of a larger community um, that's um, uh, participating in that journey um, can also be very important. Now we're gonna get um, to some specific things that seem to be particularly helpful for memory and enhancing learning. And this is um, this whole concept of intention, attention and curiosity. So I talked about mindfulness as being a way of being attentive to our present moment. It turns out that attention and being curious, that is being open to things being different, new, or um, unexpected, enhances our learning. But curiosity is something that we often can give up as we, as we go on in life. So 
I, um, from, from this uh, Getty image, you see this bowl of limes. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at these limes and get curious about their differences. So a lot of times when we see something like a bowl of apples or a bowl of limes, you go, huh, a bowl of limes or a bowl of apples. When we start paying attention and we get curious, we can go, huh, look, that one has a very peculiar shape and that one is dented in a very weird place. And oh, look, that one has some sort of darker green spots to it. Huh, I wonder what that's about. So what curiosity does is it helps us get interested in the unexpected. It enhances our learning. And what we think is it also helps increase our memory because it gets us interested in things that we often sort of maybe you would say sort of stop getting interested in. And with that memory encoding, it also helps consolidate what we learn. So um, this is a kind of fun practice. And what I would encourage you to do is get curious about something that is banal, something that you actually have in your house and you go, that you probably walk past a hundred times and go, huh, wonder what I can learn new about that thing and use it as a tool for learning um, and use it as a way of sharing and use it as a way of then um, consolidating that learning just by virtue of being curious. Now, reminders, it turns out, are not just to help us remember, but they actually are a tool for freeing up memory. Um, what you're seeing here is my reminder book. Um, and what uh, you can do here is you can think about reminders as a way of actually helping you free up what I call psychic RAM, your psychic random access memory. It turns out in this recent studies that have been done in this area, that when we actually um, put down reminders around high value tasks, two things happen. One is that we're more likely to remember just by putting it down as a reminder. And second is it frees up our memory for other things. And we start being able to remember other things because we're not trying to pay really hard attention to remembering that one thing that was a high value task or a high value thing we don't want to forget. So don't think of reminders as, as copying out. Think of them as a way to actually free up your brain for other things so that you can remember better. Now, there are other things, sort of tricks that we can do to internally remember and organize our thinking. Um, and one is the first letter method. Um, we do this. I did this a lot when I was uh, in medical school as a way of trying to remember stuff. But coming up with acronyms that help us remember things can be a tool that we use uh, that, you know, um, health, public health um programs use, but we can also use them for ourselves. So you may remember that um, FAST is an acronym that helps people remember what they should be worried about when someone presents with potential signs of stroke. FAST standing for face, um, can the person smile or is their face drooping, arms, are they able to raise their arm is one weak, speech is um, ask the person to speak, is their speech slurred, and then time, the importance of helping people remember that stroke is like a heart attack and you need to get um, uh, seek medical attention urgently. But the point about that is just that's an example of things that you can do if you are trying to remember something important is that you can turn it into a word, a word that's easier for you to remember. And even I find when I'm trying to remember like things in, in the grocery store, I come up, try to come up with a word or an acronym so that I absolutely do not forget the English muffins, which I tend to forget with some regularity unless I come up with some tool for remembering. The other thing you can do is you can cluster things. So, you know, a lot of times you'll see in, in list, um, and let's just use the grocery store since I already started that analogy as an example. If you cluster your, your um, tasks together, you're more likely to remember them. Um, and you're less likely to forget them. So if you think, okay, what are all the things I need to get in the dairy section? What are all the things I need to get in the fruits and vegetables section? That's a way of clustering memory. And then rhyming um, is another way to help um, uh, forget, uh, to help remember things. And so I'm going to test uh, your um, recollection of of some common ads that have been out there in our lifetime that you might remember that use rhymes. So 
What is the first one? Don't get mad, get someone can finish. Thank you. Glad that was fast. And then fill it to the rim with brim. Jennifer Thorne is on a roll. Thank you, Jennifer Thorne. Um, and what there's something X takes a looking and keeps on ticking. Anyone know that one? Timex watches. Oh, yeah, there's um, another person got that. So the point is that those kind of rhymes, we can use them in our daily life as a way of internally organizing things that we want to remember. And um, these help us um, just, you know, with a whole host of things. You can use these same tools, by the way, in keeping track of people. Um, another way of, 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 of um, remembering people and their names is to visualize their name and in a way that is um, helps you remember their name. So um, an example is if somebody's name is uh, Laura Barr, then you could say, oh, I'm gonna picture Laura behind bars. And you actually picture her behind bars and it makes it easier for you to remember that her last name is Barr. That's easy, that's a simple one because Barr is easy and a lot of people have last names that aren't so easy, right? But trying to think about how you can remember somebody's name um, can be still used through some of these methodologies through rhyming. And in fact, some people who have hard names will rhyme for us to help us remember their name. Um, and then thinking of ways to sort of uh, cluster what you learn about them as part of the way you keep track of their name. So, We've gone through a whole host of uh, examples of um, things that are important for memory. And um, now what I would love for us to do is don't do it yet, but put something in the chat without pressing enter <laughs> um, that based on our conversations today, one thing that you would like to change. And it could be, I want to eat one more serving of a leafy vegetable per week. But one thing, put in one thing that you want to change, but don't press enter yet. And then we'll all press enter together. And here's a funny thing in the chat. My cousin's last name was Locke and someone called her keys. I can see that happening. Yeah, sometimes we can get our, our, our connections um, slightly slightly misaligned. So is, has everybody had a chance to think about one thing yet they want to do? Okay, thumbs up, excellent. Okay, press enter. Awesome. More greens to the diet, new exercise with friends, social connections, get blood pressure lower. Awesome. More salads for lunch, more salmon, get my hearing checked, more exercise, less salt, more fish. Excellent. All right. My hope is that just by virtue of writing it down in the chat, it might be something that's just slightly easier for you to think of tomorrow because it's easy to think of these things today, but to think of tomorrow to try to do differently. So with that, I am going to say thank you, and I am going to stop sharing, and I will look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ritchie. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with some of the basic questions, and then I've got, thanks to you, I've clustered. Uh, which helps me. Uh, I, I heard you say cluster. So at the very beginning, um, someone said, I asked, are you aware of any studies that very early in the person's dementia, before significant cognitive deficit, using hypnotism for possibly later, using post-hypnotic suggestion to deal with the dementia person's behavior or other matters? That's a lot of words. I think it's studies using hypnosis. Yeah, 
I am not familiar. That's actually a great question. I love it. I'm going to go look up and see what I can learn. Um, I would say that um, if there are studies out there, my guess is that they're relatively small. And so we always have to be careful with small studies. Um, and I will look that up, but I actually do not know of studies that um, that sort of categorically um, demonstrate the value of hypnotism um, in addressing either cognitive decline or um, disruptive or, or behavioral disturbances. That being said, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, it's been an area that I've gotten very interested in um, over the past uh, year or so because I uh, have had some colleagues who are really interested in hypno um, hypnosis. So uh, how about, Judy, when we send out uh, the evaluation, I will provide an answer to that question. Great. And uh, two related questions from, from Nancy. Uh, does decline in memory eventually lead to dementia? If one lives long enough, does the slide ever level off? And a corollary is, does age at which decline begins affect whether dementia will follow? So the first is, are you okay? Do you want me to, you got it. Uh, well, let, let, let me, let me uh, try to answer it. And then Nancy can say if it's, it's been sufficiently answered. So, sure. um, so there are a number of people who have um, memory changes um, that are not severe enough to cause functional um, challenges or deficits who actually will potentially either have those memory changes or actually have less um, or have improvement and never develop dementia. So some, some memory complaints, subjective cognitive um, complaints, or, or even some um, objective indications of some mild amount of cognitive changes, because not just memory, it can be executive function, it can be um, related to visual spatial changes, et cetera. Uh, can um, be stable um, and do not lead to dementia. However, uh, people who have mild cognitive impairment are at increased risk for developing dementia, and there is a meaningful subset of people with mild cognitive impairment who will develop dementia. Once someone has developed dementia, it is the exception rather than the rule. There are outliers, and those outliers are um, 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 being studied as, as um, sort of areas where we can learn about how their journey is different. But generally speaking, once someone actually has a diagnosis of dementia, their decline is likely to continue and not to plateau, but to continue to um, decline. Okay, thank you. Nancy, uh, you can let us know. Now um, I'm going to, one, one at a time, uh, ask uh, two questions about Food. Uh, question about fish oil. Any thoughts about fish oil? There have been so many studies about fish oil. We've been so hopeful that fish oil would tell, you know, should demonstrate um, uh, benefit, especially in fish oil capsules, et cetera. Um, and essentially, we have not seen consistent evidence that fish oil by itself um, or omega 3 fatty acids. Um, are sufficiently impactful in um, affecting cognition to recommend them. Um, uh, that being said, I think um, we do know that fish and um, fish oil in, in fish products and olive oil um, are, you know, composed of um, monounsaturated fats and um, fats that seem to be um, processed in our body um, differently or better uh, than, um, than saturated fats or the types of fats that we see uh, predominantly in um, uh, uh, dairy products and, and, and um, animal, um, other kinds of um, animal um, meats, et cetera. So I would say at this point, um, the main thing with fish oil is that they do um, can, they can um, reduce our, uh, they can make our blood slightly thinner. Does that, is that helpful? Um, 
maybe, but it also can be problematic if you're actually going to surgery. So if you're going to surgery, sometimes people will say, please stop taking your fish oil or your vitamin E, because both of those things can um, affect our sort of um, regulability. But we don't have enough definitive data on fish oil to recommend it um, as a, a tool in and of itself, or excuse me, as a, as a dietary um, food in and of itself for dementia. But I think fish as part of a over sort of arching holistic approach towards dietary intake, absolutely yes. Great, thank you. Any value uh, in intermittent fasting? Oh, yes. In fact, I should have actually uh, uh, talked about this more. Um, some very interesting literature on interme um, intermittent fasting. And in fact, um, another one of my colleagues um, is doing a lot of really interesting work on this. Most of this work so far has been in animal models, but in animal models, intermittent fasting does seem to be associated with um, improvements in cognition um, and, um, and uh, slowing of cognitive decline. So I do think intermittent fasting is something we should be paying attention to. It's sort of uh, it, it's a very active study right now and um, very promising our future. Thank you. Um, and at the moment, one additional comment question that, you know, as one wants to change diet and make some changes for an individual who has diverticulitis, nuts and berries can be a problem. Uh, there's also a comment about what about walnuts and yeah. Yeah. So, 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 this, yeah. so, so very good point about diverticulitis. So if someone has diverticulosis, um, nuts are not your friend. So you may have to take that part of the mind diet out of your, out of your diet. Um, and that's true for a lot of things. You know, there are people who um, are intolerant to, fish. Um, there are people who um, have, you know, trouble with other parts of sort of the, the mind diet um, sort of portfolio. But I think um, if you have diverticulosis, um, nuts can be a problem. And if you've been recommended, you know, by your gastroenterologist to avoid nuts, or if you have, you know, a lot of people have nut allergies, then please don't um, consume nuts. Just know that if you don't have problems, um, then they can be a useful um, part of your um, overall dietary uh, menu. Thank you. Now some wonderful questions about movement. Is Tai Chi considered moderate or vigorous exercise? Definitely not moderate. I mean, she's definitely not vigorous um, and maybe not even moderate, but uh, I would say low moderate. What Tai Chi is awesome for is balance. So remember, one of the recommendations was around balance. And the predominance of, of Tai Chi is standing with, uh, is a slow movement, standing on, you know, one, one leg by and large, or moving from one leg to the other. So um, Tai Chi and yoga would fall under the category of not probably meeting the moderate to vigorous um, exercise um, uh, sort of categories, but um, still important in terms of, sort of your overall approach towards um, physical activity and health and fall into that category of balance being incredibly important for balance. Fantastic. And in fact, it's one of the few um, interventions that, that has been demonstrated to um, reduce uh, fall risk. So I'm a big fan of Tai Chi um, and it won't uh, necessarily keep you from having to do some of these other things that include um, getting your heart rate up a little bit more. Good. Thank you. Speaking of heart rate, how effective is interval training, which is brisk walk for 30 seconds, jog 20 seconds, run as fast as you can, 10 seconds? Hmm. So I think um, the most of the literature that's out there uh, for cognition, although I think this is a really interesting um, sort of niche question that I'm also going to investigate, has been looking at first exercise, not hit exercise. So um, hit exercise being high intensity, um, sort of uh, burst of, for very small amounts of time. Um, whereas, you know, what we've been looking at are, are slightly longer intervals, you know, say like 
10 minutes, 15 minutes, that sort of thing, um, where your heart rate is consistently up for a longer period of time. I don't know that that's such a bad thing. It certainly sort of falls within the category of being both moderate and vigorous. And I think if you did that over, you know, and included that as part of sort of a longer um, range approach of exercise that is still has some sustained exercise in there, then it certainly wouldn't hurt. I think the most important thing if you're doing that kind of high intensity training is to make sure that, um, you know, you've been cleared from a cardiac um, standpoint uh, so that you don't, um, you know, inadvertently uh, get yourself in, into the emergency room with, with chest pain or something like that. But I think, you know, if, if you are, um, uh, don't have any problems with any underlying cardiac disease, those kind of approaches are probably reasonable. Um, we just don't have quite as much data on them. Uh, a really interesting question about sleep uh, or comment, which is don't older persons need less sleep? We've all heard that for years. Uh, older people generally get less sleep. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we've talked about how um, as we age, um, we're more likely to have disrupted sleep for a whole host of reasons. And um, um, we may be more likely to have insomnia. And then, of course, there are a lot of things that happen in the sort of current world in which we live that increase our likelihood for both disruptive, dis disruptive sleep and um, delayed onset of sleep. That being said, um, the the... The studies don't suggest that you need less sleep. You may be getting less sleep. So still, I think between six to eight hours for most people is still um, an important target to pursue. Um, there, there's a really interesting book by uh, a, a professor at UC Berkeley. Some of you have read, may have read by Matt Walker um, called Why We Need Sleep. He talks um, a lot about um, sleep and also talks about the fact that the duration of sleep is important. So if that we tend to have cycles of sleep that are about four hours in duration, three to four hours in duration. So if you wake up, that's fine. But the idea is then to go back, to, you know, to, to um, go back to sleep to at least um, seek to have um, six to eight hours of, of um, sleep over a 24 hour period. Thank you. Um, there was a wonderful uh, comment question about uh, two people who listen and enjoy chamber music. Um, but is it, if you could speak to, which many, I think people are newly discovering, either they're making playlists of uh, uh, favorite music of years ago, or can you speak to music and how it stimulates and helps us? So this is a really fun area of research right now. So for a long time, the National Institutes of Health did not support practically any research that had to do with music. Um, and over the past, you know, five to eight years, I would say um, there have been a lot of um, a growing number of studies supported by the NIH around um, music and its benefits. And so I would say we will be seeing more and more, I think, some really interesting literature coming out around music. Playing music is incredibly um, um, beneficial for people because it, um, it is a form of um, ongoing learning, imprinting, encoding, um, and, um, and, uh, and uses complex, you know, uh, I mean, you can play your, if, if, you're, if voice is your instrument, then it may not be quite as complex, but nevertheless, um, you know, having to address um, both sort of coordination of, of um, body and um, mind to um, play a particular instrument. And then listening to music um, is can be incredibly beneficial from an affective perspective, from a mindfulness per perspective and a presence perspective. And so one would guess conceptually that it would also have a positive effect on cognition and cognitive decline. Most of the studies that um, that I'm aware of to date have really focused more on people living with dementia and its value in that context than in preventing dementia. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that we have, um, and, and you know, you can imagine that doing that study could be hard because there's so many different kinds of music and some music that is more sort of dystopic than others. <laughs> and so um, 
I'm not sure that we will necessarily completely understand the relationship between music and cognitive decline. But what we do know is that playing instruments um, and doing any kind of complex task that requires um, um, uh, learning and memory is important um, from a cognitive perspective. And we also know that people who um, are living with dementia, um, who experience music um, that is um, uh, um, familiar and evocative for them in a positive way can be important in um, reducing um, uh, behaviors um, or um, evidence of distress. And someone is asking a very important question about hearing aids just recently and only some months ago. Uh, it is now possible to buy over-the-counter hearing aids. Uh, in fact, I, ha I haven't seen them, but I keep hearing about the ones at Costco. Um, so there, there is a question, of course, uh, about recommended um, or risk-taking. Any comment? Obviously, any comment. Uh, so, so I'm just going to say that this is an area of, of, of learning for me. I'm very, very excited about this turn of events. Um, and, uh, oh, thank you to Jack Kelly, who said the Consumer Report this month did a study on hearing aids. So go to the Consumer Report. I certainly will. I think, you know, several things are going to happen. First is, um, you know, there are always concerns when things go on the market about regulation um, and around quality. So I do think that we will have to be um, in more and a buyer beware um, a sort of frame when we're um, buying over-the-counter hearing aids. So I think looking at things like consumer report, um, paying attention to sort of the, 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 the hearing aids that have a track record um, or are presumably um, uh, uh, built by a company that, that actually has a track record of, of um, producing um, prescription hearing aids as maybe a good place to start. I am thrilled about it, however, because I do think that access to hearing aids is um, contributing to profound health disparities in our country because hearing aids tend to be so expensive. And the idea that people can um, get more affordable hearing aids to me is something that I'm very excited about. And I think we're going to be in a huge learning space over the next five or so years. There are going to be some really probably terrible hearing aids that come out. <laughs> Um, and then there probably will be um, sort of a growing uh, um, group of, of companies that are made, producing really high quality hearing aids that will be real game changers and really have an impact on, I think, dementia incidents going forward. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, Janet is asking uh, again for the name and author of the sleep book. Oh, yes. It's called Why We need sleep. I think that's the name of it. It's by Matt Walker, W-A-L-K-E-R. Judy, can you write that in? Matt Walker, why we need sleep? Great. Um, thank you. Um, Heidi notices uh, and writes uh, that she notes that you're wearing a fitness watch. Uh, oops, I just lost the question, but I'll find it again. Uh, it just popped. Um, well, I hold on a second. It's coming. When Judy wrote, um, I know you're wearing a fitness watch. Are there particular watch functions that can support our efforts to maintain brain health? Oh, great question. So, you know, I think there's so many tools now to help us um, sort of uh, be attentive to the things that matter in our lives. And I think, you know, because physical activity is it's so, so important for brain health, for reducing our risk for um, a cardiovascular disease, for reducing um, um, or sort of improving our um, uh, mood and um, overall sense of well being. Anything that you can do that will help you keep track, I think is worth doing. So I don't. Um, I don't think I would promote any particular watch, but there's so many good ones out there to, to try. And some of it just depends on kind of what your needs are. You know, for me, I'm a long distance runner. So I like to be able to um, keep track of, of um, my pace and how far I'm running and that kind of thing. 
Um, but that's not for everyone. Not everybody needs to, to have the big, bulky, not sort of fairly unattractive um, fitness watch that that I that I use. But I think that um, you know, uh, Apple watches, uh, if, you know, even Timexes have um, um, there's Fitbits. There's just a whole host of things that we can use that can help us um, be attentive to making sure that we're getting those minutes of moderate activity um, or vigorous activity on a, a daily or weekly basis. So we'll, whatever works for you, um, I think is, is just great. Um, I have a question. And while I'm asking my question, which comes from your presentation, if anybody has any last questions, please put it in. We have just nine minutes. At the very beginning of your important slide on differentiating, um, normal memory changes and but what might be signs of um, a possible dementia, you mentioned apathy. And uh, apathy is a very hard thing to understand. Um, is my mother suddenly sitting and not doing much because she just retired and she's sad? Am I not creating enough socialization? Is it organic? Is she depressed? Now, obviously, it's not simple, but could you speak to apathy? Because I think it's very Absolutely. confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. And um, and it is one of the things that for many people um, who are caring for somebody living with dementia can be, frankly, distressing because it's hard to know how to interpret it. So two things. Number one is because apathy often can look like depression, it is worth you know, being evaluated for depression, um, potentially even um, um, having um, a trial of, of an antidepressant to see whether or not um, to basically sort of tease out um, apathy from um, depression. Um, that being said, if someone actually has a diagnosis of dementia and um, uh, they're unresponsive to antidepressants and um, they don't seem to be disturbed or bothered by their apathy. It's actually something that's disturbing us more um, Then that's, I think, um, often uh, an opportunity for us to think about how we can sort of adapt to this new change in personality of the person that we're caring for. And, um, and so a, a lot of times uh, what, we, what our, our opportunity is there is to sort of recognize that this is a very common feature of dementia and um, one that when we, when we see makes us worry um, and also um, warrants, I think, a further and fuller evaluation um, for uh, dementia and, and uh, for a, a you know, robust um, assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Uh... You have spoken for a long time, and every bit of it has been fascinating, invigorating, and exciting. And uh, thank you so very much. Oops. Um, and I, I, I want to, I just got one last uh, thing. One last question. Um, <laughs> can, okay. Uh, could you comment on the use of antipsychotics for dementia patients? Just a small topic. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, we could actually spend a whole hour talking about right. antipsychotic people living with dementia. Um, I think I'll, I'll try to keep it fairly focused in terms of the response. Um, so antipsychotics um, are um, uh, uh, um, increase our risk for um, mortality and for um, arrhythmias and cardiac events. Um, and um, they also can serve um, in some instances as a form of chemical restraint. So we really uh, think it's preferable when um, at all possible to avoid antipsychotics. They also have interactions with other medications that people can be on. Um, and so they, they can have all kinds of, um, sort of negative ramifications and adverse events. That being said, um, there can be times, um, especially when someone is at the end of their dementia journey, at the end of their life, um, when um, other strategies to address, um, uh, uh, you know, profound levels of distress by someone living with dementia have failed. 
and where sometimes um, uh, low doses of an antipsychotic can improve quality of life um, for that person living with dementia. So I'm not going to say that they should never be used, but they should be used very judiciously and with an understanding that they are associated with a higher rate of mortality. Um, and so uh, trying other ways to address um, psychoses or evaluating whether or not there are other ways to address um, delusions and hallucinations and agitations um, and all the kinds of behaviors that often antipsychotics are used for are important um, to do first um, before considering them. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your spectacular questions and for your participation. It was, we heard everyone speaking, even though uh, through, through chat, it was just fantastic. I'd like to remind you all that there will be a recording uh, in about 10 days on our website. And in addition, I did notice some people taking pictures, as I often do, of a slide you really want. But Dr. Uh, and Dr. Ritchie will has suggested she will be sending to us her slides. Um, so finally, um, uh, again, I, I thank you on behalf of the, our very involved, engaged, enthusiastic uh, group of people. You, there are comments, truly fabulous. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. The thank yous are coming in. And as they come in, I want to uh, uh, let everyone know tomorrow you will be receiving an evaluation form, which we ask you to complete. And we do always enjoy sending to our magnificent uh, speakers, uh, your comments, and please do. And we learn all the time about what you're eager to learn and know. And um, I also want to uh, remind everyone that next week um, on May 2nd, um, we have a speaker, uh, Hannah Schulman, uh, as part of our health and resilience program. She will be talking about caregiver burnout and stress management skills. And that notice, I think, is going out tomorrow. Um, so uh, come, keep coming. We are here. We welcome you. Thank you for your comments. And again, Dr. Ritchie, thank you for all of your information, for your guidance, for your uh, advice. And I wish you all a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.